We're in the third week of our church-wide journey towards understanding prayer. And I hope that you have experienced prayer, maybe on a, on a different level, maybe on a more profound level than you have in the past, that God is teaching you something, that he is growing you. We've said that prayer is communication between God and man, but it doesn't end there. Right, So it's, it's not just us talking to God and us listening to God. The idea is that over time, we develop an intimacy with God. We develop a closeness with God through that relationship. And, and that's really what happens in prayer. A deep friendship is built. A deep friendship is built. Today, we will be looking at what I believe to be a central prayer for every Christian because it captures the essence of Christianity. And it's a prayer that Jesus himself prayed. It's in Luke chapter 22, if you have your Bibles or if you have a Bible app like me, go ahead and turn there now. We have essentially uh, started out here, right? Uh, with a big picture understanding of prayer and talking about how it's opening up our eyes. And then we're approaching God and, and getting to know him. And as we know him, we can approach him on behalf of others. Today uh, is sort of the center of this whole prayer experience. Because it gets to, like I said, the essence of Christian belief. Which is that we are not the center. God is. Jesus is in the garden here. He has just had dinner with his disciples last time, last supper, call it. And he has told Judas, the disciple that's going to betray him, to, uh, to go and do what he's going to do quickly. And so he does. He leaves and, and so do Jesus and the disciples. And they travel over to the Mount of Olives. And when they get there, here's what happens. Jesus, accompanied by the disciples, left the upstairs room and went as usual to the Mount of Olives. There he told them, the disciples, pray that you will not give in to temptation. He walked away about a stone's throw and knelt down and prayed, Father, if you are willing, please take this cup of suffering away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. Then an angel from heaven appeared and strengthened him. He prayed more fervently and he was in such agony of spirit that his sweat fell to the ground like great drops of blood. At last, he stood up again and returned to the disciples, only to find them asleep, exhausted from grief. Why are you sleeping? He asked them. Get up and pray so that you will not give in to temptation. Prayer enables us to lay down what we want, pick up, what God wants. Prayer enables us to lay down what we want to pick up what God wants. We want a lot of things. We advocate for a lot of things. We come before God and we ask him for a lot of things. It's in prayer that all of those things are tested against the will of God. Do they match up? Do they line up? It's the posture that enables us to say, God, this is what I want, but it's not about what I want. It's about what you want. So it kind of forces us to have the right perspective. When we approach God with this prayer, it's kind of impossible to walk away with the wrong answer, right? It's not what I want, it's what you want. So the question is, what does God want? What does God want? Well, one thing he wants that we know for sure that he wants is you. He wants you. So the first war that he will win is on the inside of you. The first war that he will win is on the inside. When Jesus meets his uh, disciples and he invites them to be his disciples for the first time, what does he say to them? He says, follow me follow me. He doesn't say, can I join you in whatever you're doing? I just want to join you. Can I do that? 
I like to use this illustration. When we think about, you know, being a Christian, a lot of times we picture it like this. We're sitting on a couch and Jesus walks into the room, kind of gives his spiel, you know, and we say, sure, I'll invite you into my life. I want to be a Christian. And so we invite Jesus into our life. And he comes over and he sits down on the couch and he watches the football game with us. And then when we get up to go get a drink, he goes with us. We got to go to the store and pick up something. So he goes with us. And then we've got all these errands that we need to run and he goes with us. And we've got this life that we're living and these things that we're pursuing. And he goes with us. A better picture is this, that we're sitting on the couch and Jesus walks in the door And he says, follow me. And he stands there until you make a choice. Do you want to follow or do you want to stay seated? And if we choose to follow, we get up and we follow him. And he walks out the door and we notice that in the street, there's thousands and millions of other people who are also following him. It's actually not about us at all. It's about him. And we're not even close to the only ones who are following him. We're all doing this together. And he dictates where we go. And he dictates what we do. That is the picture of following Jesus. To follow Jesus is to abandon yourself, is to leave yourself behind and to pursue him. David Platt says this, an observation of American Christianity, and I happen to agree with it because it speaks to me. So I'm implicated in this quote, which is why I agree with it. We are settling for a Christianity. Kevin is settling for a Christianity. You are settling for a Christianity that revolves around catering to ourselves. When the central message of Christianity is actually about abandoning ourselves. Christians are simply people who say yes to Jesus. No matter what that means, we say yes to Jesus. Now you might be thinking, of course, that's simple, it's easy. Well, it's not because the thing with Jesus is that when he invites us to something, it often requires radical obedience. Jesus will call you to radical obedience. The disciples that I mentioned earlier, James and John, Peter and Andrew, what a radical obedience look like for them? Well, it looked like dropping their nets, leaving their profession behind, leaving their family and their business behind, leaving any hopes or aspirations that might have been connected with that family and business behind in order to follow Jesus. He'll call you to radical obedience, but he's not asking you to do something that he's not done. Right here in this text that we just read, Jesus is praying before the Father. If there's any other way to do this, can we do it? Can, can you let this cup pass from me? He's agonizing. He's very anxious. This word, by the way, agonia is the Greek word. And what it means is contest. That's the, kind of the, the primitive root is contest. So the feeling that it's describing is the feeling that you might have had when you were about to get married. Or maybe you played in a, in a state uh, playoff game, all right? A lot of people were there and uh, you were starting and there was a lot of pressure on you. You know, that feeling that you get in the pit of your stomach, it's, it's, a, it's an anxiety, it's a nervousness. That's, that's what this Greek word is talking about. But Jesus is experiencing it on an entirely different level than you or I have ever experienced it. He's struggling with this, which is why he goes before God in prayer. That's why, that's why he goes, right? Because he's struggling and says, if it's possible, let this pass from me. But it's not about what I want, 
It's what you want. When through prayer, we become aware of what God's will is. When we figure out exactly what he wants us to lay down and what exactly he wants us to pick up, the only choice we have is to say yes. Remember, Christians are people who say yes to Jesus. The only choice that we have is to say yes. Now, it might terrify us to say yes. It might not make any sense to say yes, but we have to say yes. That's what being a Christian is, saying yes to Jesus. Have some friends, Eric and Leah. And Eric and Leah, several years ago, felt called to start this ministry for guys who are just out of college who might be struggling with their faith. Actually, Eric came up here on a Sunday morning and, and asked for guidance and prayer, direction from God. That was probably four years ago, maybe three years ago. And the intention was that they were going to start this ministry right here, you know, in Waynesville, maybe Bellbrook or Centerville, Springboro, somewhere, you know, close. God had different plans. So God actually opened up doors for this ministry to happen. And a really crazy story, the way that it all kind of unfolded, but it was very, very clear that God was leading them to Upland, Indiana, right? Who wants to go to Indiana? (laughs) God's calling them to Upland, Indiana to start this ministry. And so as close friends of of mine, and we have a a big group of of, uh, friends that are really close, some of us have said to Eric and Leah along the way, you know, guys, this doesn't make very much sense. <laughs> also, they're some of our best friends. And so we don't want them to leave to go to Upland, Indiana to do this. And they've just found this community of people where they feel secure, where they feel like they belong. And, and they don't really want to leave either. But yet Jesus has called them to this ministry. And the only choice they have is to say yes. So Milt Chambly, sitting over here, good looking guy. He, as a minister of communications, he went with Eric to Indiana and uh, captured this story of, of sort of why this thing is happening and, and, um, and you'll get to kind of see, kind of see it unfolding here. Eric and Leah moved, I think three weeks ago to launch this ministry in Upland, Indiana. And here's a video to show you about it. When I was an infant, I almost suffocated to death. My parents rushed me to the hospital, didn't know if I was gonna make it. And as my mom and dad were crying out to God in the waiting room, my mom felt very strongly that God made her a promise for my life out of Psalms. So I always struggled through school. They don't know if that accident attributed to that or not. My parents took me to church Sunday morning, Sunday night and Wednesday night. I was went to Bible camp every year and was in the youth group and those are all good things. They were helping build a foundation for me to build my life upon. The problem was is I didn't own it. Why it was life changing and life giving. So my parents insisted I go to a year of Bible school. I didn't want to go to college at all, but I said that's fine. And I went to Cedarville University. Problem is, the Bible became a textbook while I was there. And after that semester, I really felt like I wasn't supposed to be there anymore. My walk had become stagnant and I really didn't find what I was hoping to find while I was there. A deep understanding of my own faith. So when I left, I went to my oldest brother Dan and I asked him if he'd be willing to invest in me. And he came back and he said, yeah, but if we're going to do it, we're going to do it right. We're going to live life on life. See, he started a program uh, with me that was tailored to my learning style. He was concentrating on my heart, not my head and it changed my life. And that's the spirit of what I want to do with Anchor 41. I'm looking for that guy that maybe grew up in the church, but's had big questions, maybe hasn't really owned their faith. 
Well, I want them to come stay for a year, learn some trade skills, learn how to turn some wrenches, learn how to be Jesus to somebody. We're gonna strip this thing down and they're gonna come face to face with who God really is in a environment that is encouraging authenticity, not playing the game, but facing yourself in the mirror, realizing who you are, realizing who Christ is, and why that foundation that perhaps mom and dad tried so hard to give you is very worthy of being built on. And that's what Anchor 41 is all about. It's a story of a real family here at Crossview that said yes to Jesus. Jim and Elizabeth Elliot, who were missionaries, famously, um, there's a movie made about them, End of the Spear is what it's called. And I think Randy talked about this a few weeks ago. Even Jim Elliott and four other guys went over and tried to establish a relationship with uh, these Indians, this unreached tribal group. And uh, they ended up all being slaughtered and killed by them. Well, a couple years later, Jim's wife went back. And because of her ministry there, because of her showing, like demonstrating Christ's forgiveness, these people, a lot of them became believers. And it's just an incredible story. But while Jim was there, before he died, he kept a journal. And he wrote this in, in his journal. And I wanted to read it today because I think that it's pretty applicable to us. Last week I said that um, I believe that Crossview is a sleeping giant, that we need to wake up and prayer is the thing that will wake us up. And I found this quote this week and I think that it is kind of like right in line with that. We are so utterly ordinary, so commonplace. While we profess to know a power the 20th century does not reckon with, but we are harmless and therefore unharmed. We are spiritual pacifists, non-militants, conscientious objectors in this battle to the death with principalities and powers in high places. Meekness must be had for contact with men, but brass outspoken boldness is required to take part in the comradeship of the cross. We are sideliners coaching and criticizing the real wrestlers while content to sit by and leave the enemies of God unchallenged. This world cannot hate us. We are too much like its own. All oh, that God would make us dangerous. All oh, that God would make us dangerous. People like Eric and Leah, people like Jim and Elizabeth Elliot become dangerous to the powers that oppose the kingdom of God. Become dangerous. Because the thing that's most dangerous to Satan and his kingdom are people who say yes to Jesus. People who say yes to Jesus. Radical obedience makes us dangerous. Radical obedience makes us dangerous. What is Jesus trying, or what is Satan trying to accomplish with Jesus here in the garden? He's trying to get him to abandon this, just like he did when he met him in the desert and the temptation. He was trying to say, hey, you don't need to do it God's way. You don't need to do it the Father's way. Do it this way. It'll be better. Well, Jesus in the garden is struggling with this reality that he's supposed to do this. The best, most productive thing that Satan could have done is to convince Jesus not to do it. And if he would have, there would be no hope. Like seriously, no hope. We would be done. The most productive thing Satan could have accomplished was to get Jesus to compromise his obedience to participating in God's mission. And the most productive thing that he can accomplish with you is to do the same. Notice the contrast between Jesus here and the disciples here. Jesus is off praying, sweating like drops of blood in agony preparing himself for his part in this massive world-shaking redemption project. And the disciples are sleeping. 
Are you sleeping? The most productive thing that Satan can do to accomplish with you is to make you so caught up in your own world, in your own preferences, in your own pursuits, in your own troubles, in your own agenda, that you miss out on being a part of God's grand story, which is what you were created for. And Jesus says to you, pray that you might not fall into temptation. Prayer enables us to lay down what we want to pick up what God wants. Now, might sound like a foolish thing to do. There are people that look at us and say, well, that's foolish. Well, Jim Elliott in his diary wrote a quote that I think is perfect for that. It's probably his most famous quote. He says, he is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose.